our next speaker um, will uh, get started in a second. Um, first, just wanted to introduce uh, a couple more of us, the student organizers. Um, my name is Josh Weisberg, uh, LGO student as well, like Paolo, um, and was one of the content leads to bring in all of uh, our really great speakers. So hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah, and my name's Catherine. I'm the other content co-lead, also an LGO doing a master's in operations research. Cool. Um, and then uh, we'll introduce uh, our next speaker while he's getting set up in, in the back. Um, so Professor, professor Rama Ramakrishnan is professor of the practice in data science and applied machine learning at uh, the Sloan School. Um, prior to Sloan, he was a founder or senior executive in several uh, analytics and machine learning software companies with successful exits to uh, several of the uh, titan of, of technology companies. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to us uh, a little bit about this. <laughs> um, we'll let him uh, come join us. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. So we, I have 35 minutes plus five minutes of Q&A, and I have 108 slides. I will get through them. <laughs> and the reason I have so many slides you is because all right, I tend to move around, so this is going to cramp my style, but that's okay. Uh, it's okay. I, I think I've got it. Thank you. So uh, the reason I have so many slides is because there's just so much good stuff that I wanted to share with you, and I had to find a way to just put it all in, in the hope that maybe I'll actually get through it in 35 minutes. Um, so just don't ask me any questions. <laughs> okay, please, we will have questions. So, you know, the conventional wisdom, I'm going to dive right in, the conventional wisdom with, data, uh, with deep learning and with AI is that you do need a lot of labeled data to build good models, right? That's what we all believe. That's what we've all been trained on. And that is, to a large extent, not untrue, right? It's mostly true. However, this thing is sort of an easy thing if you're a Google or an Amazon or a Facebook, right? Because you're a consumer internet company, you have a lot of unlabeled data, and they are, you can automatically label them as a, so almost as an effortless side effect of your operations, right? You, you show an ad, figuring out if somebody clicked on it or not, which is sort of your label, whether someone clicked or not, it's automatic. The click is in the log stream, right? So you can find out. So it's effortless to label this stuff. It's very easy. What about everybody else? Right? What about the healthcare uh, organizations, manufacturers, educational institutions, and so on? For them, it's actually very, very difficult to label data. It's very difficult to annotate data. So how can they best leverage AI and deep learning is sort of the key question. Okay? And what I'm going to do today is to tell you some of the latest thinking and best practices for how, even when you have very little labeled data, you can still get the job done. All right? Okay. So imagine you're the CEO of a manufacturer of office furniture. Right? You sell your products directly through e-commerce sites, um, through, you know, through, through other channels, and people post reviews of your products on social media. And as you can see here, and I, I, you probably can't see it very clearly, but the first one says, there was an order in the first few days. Who would have thought? Okay? An order from an office chair. The second one says, the chair seat seems slightly tilted to the left. The third one says, it wobbles from side to side. The point is, all these reviews have very valuable nuggets of information, right? So now, given the ever-growing number of reviews that you have, because your business is very really successful, congratulations, you can't manually read through all of them, right? You have to have some automatic way to take this and figure out if a review is worth sending to a human being for further analysis and for further review, right? So how would you do this? Well, you've all been trained in AI. You know exactly how this works. So you, what you do is you have a team of people uh, manually read and review each label, I'm sorry, each, each review with these three labels. There is a potential improvement idea here, there is a potential defect here, neither, okay? And once you have these reviews, and for each review you have one of these three labels, great, you're in sort of traditional, safe, supervised learning territory, you can go ahead and build a model, right? Life is good. There is only one problem. You will need thousands, if not tens of thousands of reviews to be manually labeled if you want a good model, right? And this will be a very expensive and very time-consuming manual effort. Uh, now, unlike looking at the canonical dog versus cat example in deep learning, where it's pretty easy to figure out if it's a dog or a cat, figuring out if a particular review is actually a defect or an improvement is actually more tricky, right? And in fact, different expert labelers may actually disagree on what the label is. And if that happens, guess what? You will have to have some process for adjudicating across labelers. In short, a big pain in the neck, okay? 
So now the key question, of course, is what can we do? What, anything we can do to reduce the number of labels needed is going to be a huge win for you, and it's going to dramatically change your return on effort, your return on investment. Okay? That's the key question. Now, the answer to the key question is a beautiful thing, which is that deep neural networks are representation learners. And I'm going to explain to you exactly what that means, because that is the key to the unlock. So recall, if you have a deep neural network, what happens? You have an input. It flows through a whole bunch of layers, one after the other. And then on the right side, the output pops out. Okay? And given the fact that these are deep networks, you probably have lots and lots and lots of layers. All right? Now, the thing is, you, you take the raw input that went into the network, and then it goes through the first layer. What comes out of that first layer, you can think of it as a transformed version of the raw input. Right? Similarly, what comes out of the second layer is a transformed version of the original input. It just has happened to go through two transformations instead of one. So these things, the, the, these intermediate representations of the raw input, they are called representations. That's actually you know, part of the nomenclature. They are called representations. And from this perspective, you can sort of think of a deep neural network as really doing two things. It's actually learning useful representations of your raw input, Plus, it's learning a model, a regression model, which can take those transformations to predict the things that you actually want to predict for that particular problem. Right? So it's sort of, you're getting a twofer when you train a deep neural network for a particular problem. Now, equivalently, you can think of each layer of this network as an encoder, which takes in the raw input and encodes it into a different representation. Okay? And by this, from this perspective, you can think of a neural network is actually having lots of encoders. The first layer is one encoder. The first two layers is another encoder. The first three layers is another encoder. You get the idea, right? So effectively, a deep neural network can be viewed equivalently from two different perspectives. It learns some useful representations plus a final model. It learns a bunch of good encoders plus a final model. And these are equivalent, right? And I will use them interchangeably. All right? Cool. So now, the key question, of course, why we go to all this trouble is that, OK, what do these representations actually contain? Is it general knowledge about the input data? Or is it specific knowledge that was needed to map the input data to the particular thing that you wanted to predict? Or is it a bit of both? OK? Now, and here comes the beautiful fact. As it turns out, these representations actually embody a lot of intrinsic general knowledge about the inputs. So in this example, we have a deep network that is trained to classify uh, images of everyday scenes and objects into one of a thousand different categories. You know, dogs, I mean, animals and furniture and this and that. You get the idea. Everyday scenes and objects. And that is what this network was trained for. Okay? Give it an input, classify it to one of a thousand things. Now, if you look at what's going on in the first layer, and I'm sorry, I can't zoom in on that. If you look at what is coming out of that first layer, the representation that's coming out of the first layer, you will actually see, if you, if you sort of squint, that it's actually picking up lines. It's picking up the presence of vertical lines, horizontal lines, diagonal lines, and so on and so forth. If you look at what's coming out of the second layer here, you will find that it's, it's picking up little curves and arcs. It's picking up the, the sort of the combination of two lines to form an edge. It's, it's detecting small gradations in color. All right? So it's picking up slightly more complicated things right, than the first layer. If you look at the third layer here, it's actually picking up honeycomb structures hexagonal tiling patterns. It's picking up you know, uh, the sort of the outline of what looks like a human form. So the point here is that there are two important takeaways from this. The first one is that these intermediate representations do, in fact, capture interesting, intrinsic aspects of the input data, number one. Number two, since each layer is essentially processing what the previous layers have produced for it, each layer is, in some sense, standing on the shoulders of giants. Right? So what it means is that the, the layer number 13 doesn't have to learn about lines and little edges and so on. It can take them as primitives and learn more complicated things. Right? So each, you can think of it as sort of climbing a ladder of abstraction, where each layer learns more complicated things because the Lego blocks it was fed were already pretty complicated. Okay, so those two things are going on with representations. And here's another example. You have a deep network trained to detect faces. That's it. Give it an image. Is that a human face or not? And you can see here, the first layer, again, is detecting edges and arcs. The second layer is actually detecting like a circle. It could, it's detecting like half a nose. 
and so on. And finally, it's actually putting all these things together to get the whole face. Okay? So, so from this, it's clear that there is some general knowledge that's learned in these representations. So the obvious question is, how can we le leverage this general knowledge? Okay? Now, these representations, since they are capturing intrinsic aspects of the input, when I say intrinsic, what I mean is these aspects are not tied to the particular problem that the neural network was trained to predict, like faces. Intrinsic things like lines and circles and edges. What it suggests is that maybe we can take, for example, the face detection network and then use it to build an emotion detection network. Because faces are the input, the same kind of input, maybe we can just like piggyback on what this f uh, face detection thing already learned, okay? And so if we can somehow, with encodes, get an encoder for the particular problem we wanna, that we're trying to solve from somewhere, boy, wouldn't it be great? Because we can just take that encoder, attach a couple of final layers, and then just train that. And hopefully, because this encoder that we are borrowing from somewhere was already trained with lots of data for something else, maybe we don't have to have that much new data to train it with, right? Essentially, somebody already trained something with a bunch of data, and therefore, you can subtract the data from the data you might otherwise need, and which means that you, with very little data, maybe you can actually get the job done, okay? And so, this idea, uh, so, the key thing is we don't have to spend our precious data on learning representations because it's learned by somebody else already. So we piggyback on them, and therefore we won't need as much data. So that brings us to the first of several techniques, which exploits this fundamental insight about what representations capture, and that's transfer learning, right? So I said if you can somehow get a good encoder, why wouldn't it be great? Well, here is one possibility. Maybe somebody else in your organization took product reviews, to go back to the, the furniture example, maybe they took product reviews and used it to build a sentiment detector. Is this product review saying good things about us or bad things about us, right? If they used reviews in general, maybe you can use that. So that neural network took the same input as what we had, right? It took the same input, but it had different outputs because somebody else was solved it for a different problem. And there the output was sentiment, okay? But it doesn't matter because Fundamentally, this network has probably already, quote unquote, learned some useful things about the English language. It has learned some useful things about the kind of text that shows up in product reviews. And that knowledge clearly is embodied in those representations. So what we can do is, this knowledge is sitting in these representations. So if you take the final representation before it goes into the output layer, that's probably a pretty excellent uh, representation of the kind of things that go on in product reviews, right? So we can simply take that, we can chop off the end, and we can take the remaining model, the headless model, and that's our encoder, okay? And we do that, then we attach our new output layers, and here is where our label data first makes an appearance, okay? We have our label data, which is just product improvement, whatever, and then we attach it, and then we just train this network, right? We either train just the final layer, or we train it end to end, and so on and so forth, and this process is called fine tuning. You take a pre-trained model, and then you adjust the weights for your particular problem. Now, this whole process is called transfer learning, and why does it matter? It's because transfer learning can dramatically reduce the amount of labeled data that you need. So here's an example. Uh, folks who have worked in computer vision may be very familiar with this data set. It's called CIFAR 10. You have 10 classes of objects, uh, airplane, automobile, you, you, know, you see it here. And there are, in the data set, you have essentially you know, 5,000 training and 1,000 uh, test images for each class, right? So if you didn't know any better, you would take this 6,000, right, and train it, build a model. However, what these folks did in this, in this example that I refer to here, they took just 50 examples of each class, okay? 50, actually, I, I, t I take it back, sorry. Five examples from each class, 10 classes in total, 50 images in total. Then they take this pre-trained model right there, uh, which is trained on some other data set, they fine tune it, and they get to 95% accuracy on that set. Okay? Just think about it, 50 examples. This is deep learning, folks, with 50 examples. Okay? So the, the data is compelling, and it's, you can see it across the board. I can, I can give you numerous references for how this, this, this actually plays out. Uh, all right, so transfer learning, as you can see, is the first technique, and a lot of people use it, and it may not be new news to you. Okay? Now, the problem with transfer learning, pardon me, The problem with transfer learning, of course, is that you need somebody else needs to have built a model using similar inputs, 
That sort of fits Achilles' heel. OK, what if we can't find it? What if such a thing doesn't exist? What do you do then? Right? How will we get an encoder? Right? And so the question is, can we build an encoder by ourselves? And the important thing is, you need to be able to do it without any label data. Because if you need label data, well, we are back to sort of you know, how things were you know, circa 20, 2019. Right? So how do, you, how do you build an encoder without labels? It's, it seems almost impossible, like a magic trick. Okay? And amazingly, this is possible. And the idea is called self-supervised learning. And the idea is incredibly simple when you, when you read it. But I'm telling you, it's very, very powerful because it is repeatedly shown to be super effective. So here, you have a situation. So the key idea is this. You take the input data. Remember, it's the input, not the output. The input data, which means it's unlabeled. It's just the input. And then you essentially knock holes in the input. And then you build a network to fill in the holes. Right? So schematically, this is how it will look like. So you have your original input. This could be a piece of text. It could be anything. And I'll give you examples of, for different kinds of input data in a second. This input, you, you randomly punch a hole in it. And that whatever you punched out becomes your label. And whatever is left behind is your modified input. So essentially, you're creating fake labels from your data. Okay? So you do this. Once you do that, well, you're back into good old traditional supervised learning territory where you have inputs and outputs, inputs and outputs, which means you can train a neural network to predict the outputs and the inputs. Okay? That's it. And so note here that there are no true labels anywhere, only fake labels. Okay? So, for example, if you have text data, let's say, I mean, I just took the mission statement of the Sloan School here, and you take that s phrase, and then, oops, um, you want to do, so you, you want to take this phrase, and let's say you want to do predict something with it. You don't care what it is. You want to predict something with it, and you take this, and your self-supervised learning, what you do is, you punch a bunch of holes in it. You remove all these words, right, the ones with the blanks. That is the input, and the output is basically the ones that, the, 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 the things you blanked out, okay? You see that, you get the idea. It's even possible for structured data, amazingly enough. So here you have just a nice little spreadsheet-like, database-like, you know, rows and columns structured data situation. You take that, you take each row of, you, each, you take each row, oh, sorry. You take, you take the first row, and then you, and you randomly knock out something. So in this case, for example, you knocked out education, you made it a question mark. Okay, maybe you knocked out something else in the second row and so on. And so the ones with the question marks and everything else intact goes in, and the prediction is the, basically replace the question mark with the right value. Okay? Yeah, I think you get the idea, right? That's self-supervised learning. Okay, does it work? Uh, so in the process of learning to fill in the blanks, the neural network learns beautiful representations of the input data. Because it kind of makes sense, right? Suppose you give, me an, if you give me a bunch of inputs, and you blank out parts of the input and say, OK, Rama, why don't you figure out what the, why don't you figure out the blanks? For me to figure out the blanks really well, I better understand the relationship between everything else that's going on in that sentence or in that input. Otherwise, I can't figure out the blanks. I can't fill in the blanks, right? So by dint of building a network that can fill in the blanks, the network, as, a, as an effortless side effect, learns these amazing representations of the kind of input you have, OK? And once you do that, right, once you build it, you just extract an encoder from it, just like you do for transfer learning. You extract an encoder from it. You attach you know, the particular uh, you know, labels that you care about for your pro problem on the right. Uh, right, right there. And note, again, this is the first, first time point at which your labels actually come into the picture. Right? Again, I want to point that out. Your, your labels are kind of come late in the game. Okay? And you do that. You do transfer learning. This whole thing. Right? Self-supervised learning plus fine-tuning is the second technique that you use. Now, does it work? Of course, it works beautifully. So here is a shocking statistic I read. They took a, a model, you know, they, they took a best-performing model for an image recognition task, and they fine-tuned it using this on only 1% of the labels. Okay? And it gets to 86% accuracy, outperforming the model that was built from scratch with all labels. So not only is this thing able to actually do as well as a model that's trained on 100 times more labels, it does better. OK? So, so that is self-supervised learning. Right? I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. The, the only thing I want to point out is that when you have images, 
right? The idea of self supervised learning, the most natural thing you would think of is to take an image, punch out a hole in it, and then have the network fill in the hole. That actually works reasonably well, but actually a better way to do it is to take two images, take an image, create two versions of it, slightly sort of perturbed, and then run it through something called contrastive loss, okay? In the interest of time, I'm not gonna get into it, but that's called contrastive learning. You can Google it. That is sort of the state of the art method for learning good representations of images, all right? Uh, okay, let's go through that. Uh, all right, fine. So I think I will talk about BERT because it's so cool. <laughs> Now, I've talked about two techniques, right, in which you can pre-train something, and then using only a fraction of the labels you otherwise need, you get the job done. But it actually gets even better than that. So if your input data, in particular, is natural language text, right, why, why would you just restrict yourself to just your reviews? Remember, the first step is to take your review data and create these self-supervised learning models, but that review data is just text. Why, could, why do you have to restrict yourself to your 100,000 pieces of text? Why can't you do it on all of Wikipedia? After all, it's just English, right? For it to learn English, why restrict it to reviews? So yeah, so we can take this whole setup that we just looked at, where we punch out holes, and then we train it on all of English Wikipedia, right? What if we did that? Guess what, somebody did it for us, the folks at Google, and that's called BERT. This model is essentially that idea where you punch out holes and fill in the blanks, trained on all of English Wikipedia, okay? And it's a fantastic pre-trained encoder if you're input is English language text. Uh, by the way, they have BERT for Italian and all kinds of world languages. It's not just for English. I'm just using English as for illustration. Okay? So if, you're, if your particular task involves working with natural language of any kind, go Google BERT for that language and make sure you use it as a pre-trained encoder. Okay? And you'll probably get the job done with a fraction of examples you would otherwise need, labeled examples. Okay? So that's that. Now, so, so far, I just want to summarize where we are, right? Which is we have been advocating this two-step process, right? First, um, download an encoder or build one using your unlabeled data, and once you do that, now get some labeled data and fine-tune it, okay? The, your labeled data comes in only for fine-tuning. And the promise of this whole thing that I'm talking about is that step two, hopefully, will, you'll get the job done with a few hundred labels. That's it, not thousands of labels. Okay, so uh, now, the first step is actually made dramatically easier by the existence of something called a model hub. Okay? Model hubs are venues where researchers and practitioners worldwide upload their pre-trained models for you to use. Right? There are three very popular ones. There is the TensorFlow hub, uh, the PyTorch hub, and the Hugging Face hub. Now, the, the, the beauty and the usefulness of these hubs is that the first step is now made dramatically easier. So, so very roughly, the guidelines are that if you have everyday images, okay? If you have everyday images, just download a pre-trained image encoder, like ResNet 50, for example, is a very popular one. Just download it, and then fine tune it, okay? And you can download from any of these hubs. However, if your images are specialized, you know, images are like MRIs, X-rays, or images from, you know, like an assembly line for, you know, visual inspection in a manufacturing assembly line, and so on, those are not everyday objects. Those are very specialized. And for that, using, you know, something like a ResNet 50 may not work all that well. What you want to do is you want to use contrastive learning to build your own encoder with your unlabeled images, okay? That's what you do here. If you're, uh, and if, you, if your uh, input is text, use BERT as a starting point. If your input is tabular data, there is something called TabNet, and you can get the code for it. You just download away. You can take it and then work with it, and that will dramatically speed up time to value for your model development efforts, okay? So that's a quick summary. So the story so far is don't start from scratch. Assess, access a pre-trained encoder from one of the model hubs, or if you can't find one because you have a unique data set or something, build your own encoder using self-supervised learning, okay? And then fine tune it, all right? Okay. We've covered a lot of research in about 15 minutes, so I'm gonna take a drink of water. <laughs> all right. How much time do we have, folks? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Q &A. 10 minutes in Q&A? All right, I'll go through this in like two minutes because it's incredible. So, but it gets even better and a bit weirder, okay? So, as they built larger and larger models for processing na natural language using self-supervised learning like BERT, right? It, you know, the, the, these are some of the, 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 the models that people have used. Something remarkable happened when they went from a model with 1.5 billion parameters to a model with 175 billion parameters. Okay, so it shifted, you go two orders of magnitude bigger, 
on the model size, but everything else about the model is pretty much the same. Okay? It's not doing anything different. And it's trained in exactly the same way as before. So look at this. These, these are from sober researchers, okay? An emergent property that was neither specifically trained for nor anticipated arose. If this sounds like a bit like a Skynet Terminator moment, yeah, I got that feeling too. Right? Like the, it's sort of like the model suddenly became self-aware, right? So now the key thing they notice is that you could control these models using something called prompting, which was an emergent phenomenon which only the barest glimpses were visible in a smaller model. So what is prompting? So the prompting, all right, here's an example. You know how you have a model, I've talked about the fact that you take your own data and fine tune it. And what does fine tuning mean? Just to refresh everyone's memory, you attach some new layers to your network, right? You gather up your own labeled data, and then you essentially train it, right? Gradient descent again and again, a whole bunch of times, which means that all the weights are being updated with the data you have, okay? So meaning a whole bunch of compute is going on with your own labeled data before you can actually use it for anything, right? But with prompting, what you do is you just gather up a few examples. So for example, here, let's say that you want to build uh, a, a, an application which takes in potentially grammatically wrong English input and corrects it and gives you the right input, okay? You don't have to go and gather hundreds of, you know, wrong, right, wrong, right examples. You can just take a few examples. So for example, here, poor English, I, I eat it, the purple berries, the right one, I ate the purple berries, right? You have three examples like that. And then you give it a poor example. I would be more than happy to work with you in another project. And this entire thing, entire thing goes into the model. And because the model is seeing examples of what you're looking for, right? Here's my input, here's the output I want. Here's the input, report. just three examples or four examples, it actually produces the right output, okay? So you can see here, I'd be more than happy to work with you on another project. That's the output. No fine tuning. You literally took a model off the shelf. You gave it three of your own examples for your particular application that you want to build, and it gives you the right answer back. Okay, so, uh, and you can see all these things, right? There's lots of examples of prompting going on. In fact, the, the, the implication of this is actually profound in my opinion, because you can actually build models with no fine tuning, okay? Which sounds a bit shocking, okay? But again, just to, just to, to be realistic about this, this is right now mostly relevant only if your input is la natural language. Okay, number one. Number two, a lot of the examples you see of prompting out in the, on the web are cherry picked. Right? It has a lot of stuff where it doesn't make any sense what it comes out, but obviously they're not going to you know, talk about that in their blog post. So uh, it's cherry picked. But don't let these two you know, criticisms sort of you know, dampen your enthusiasm for figuring out what's going on with prompting because you have to keep your eye on it. There's something very interesting going on. People are building beautiful applications just with prompting with no fine tuning, so it's worth paying attention to. But it is sort of bleeding edge, so you know, be, be aware of that. Okay, so what that means is that, uh, all right, so, don't start from scratch. The second is just keep an eye on, these, are, these big models are called foundation models, by the way. Um, so keep an eye on them and keep an eye on prompting because maybe three, five years from now, it may actually be enterprise ready, okay? And, uh, and you need to dabble in it to figure out what's going on. All right. Finally, iterating on data. So what iterating on data actually means, so now we have talked about all the stuff involving modeling. Now we're gonna switch gears and look at the data. Okay, what iterating on data means, usually what we do is we get a bunch of data and then we keep iterating on the model, right? More layers, more hidden units, use dropout, don't use dropout, change the learning rate, change this, change that, right? And, it's, and, and trust me, it's a lot of fun, okay? And it's much more enjoyable to iterate on the model than iterate on the data, okay? So for example here, writing a new model was a beautiful refuge to hide from the mess of understanding the real problem, which is probably like a profound general meta statement. Uh, and then here, this person, I just love this line. We are telling people to put on galoshes, jump into the sewer, that's your data, and splash around. Not an easy sales pitch if you're used to beautiful PyTorch land. Folks here who have built models on their own know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? So the problem is, iterating on data actually may have much better ROI than iterating on the model, right? So here, there's a thing which says that, you know, some, they did an analysis, 10 points of accuracy were due to things like, uh, Excuse me. But due to things like you know augmentation and others, you know how you me feed the right data to the machine, while only you know a few basis points were due to better models. So in some sense, the pre-trained models of today are actually already pretty darn good. 
Okay, so as long as you're using a pre-trained model, you're sort of, you're done. You're sort of on the asymptote already. So what you want to do instead is focus on the data. Get the pre-trained model and focus on your data. And what focus on the data means is that, by the way, this whole thing is called the data-centric AI movement. It's sort of an emerging movement. Uh, there are beginning to be conference, you know, uh, sort of special sessions for it and so on. Pay close attention to it because I think it's really valuable. Um, and so the idea is that how do you systematically engineer the data used to feed the system, right? Keep the system fixed, f fiddle around, modify the data. So the, here is a setup, okay? You've, 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 you've been paying attention so far, so you know that you, any problem you have, you have to either download a pre-trained encoder or build your own, and you've done that. You've gone ahead and labeled some data, which are hopefully just a few hundred examples. And by the way, we have not talked about data augmentation, but it is like, basically, it's the only free lunch in my opinion, in this whole enterprise. If you can use data augmentation, increase your sample size, you should, right? It's worth like a whole lecture by itself, a talk by itself, which I won't get into. And I'm just like, you know, glossing over it for the moment. Once you do that, you set up a model, okay? And a model is basically you get the pre-trained encoder and you attach a couple of final heads to it, right? Uh, edged with a bunch of layers. Okay, then what, what happens next? So what you want to do is you want to actually train the model, evaluate the model, modify the data. Don't modify the model. Modify the data and repeat the loop till it gets good enough. Okay? And what do I mean by modify the data? There are, there are lots of things going on here, but there are perhaps the two most important ones I want you to, uh, to remember are fix the labels and then get additional label data in a very targeted way. So, fix the labels. Uh, now, the problem with inconsistent labels is as follows. Right? So here I have a very simple schematic where you know, you know, you're trying to find a classifier to distinguish between the black points and the white points, okay? And it, as you can see, it's kind of a nice boundary, right? A uh, nice textbook -y boundary, right? Any classifier worth its salt is gonna find that boundary, okay, if you give it, because it's sort of cleanly separable. However, your data is bad, and therefore you have these two points which are actually white points that have shown up on this side of the line, right? They have been mislabeled in other ways. Maybe it was a typo when somebody entered the data, who knows, it was mis mislabeled. And this is going to cause havoc on your classifier, right? Because what's going to happen is, uh, if you use a, you know, a nice deep learning model for this, lots of layers and stuff, it's going to be very expressive. It has a lot of modeling capacity. So it's going to go out of its way to grab these you know, offending points and build a boundary like that. Basically, it's going to overfit the data because it's trying to drive the training loss to zero, okay? It all looks harmless enough till you start evaluating on the validation data, okay? And when you start evaluating on the validation data, what happens? Here is some validation data where there's, there's a new bunch of data. And these are all, again, just you know, good, good old black points, which were not in the training set, but they're all on the right side of the boundary. But because of this very highly wiggly overfitted line that you created, these are all going to be misclassified. OK? So in short, if you have bad labels with a small data set and using a powerful model, you're really, really going to have very poor generalization very poor, you know, very bad overfitting, it's going to have poor performance, okay? So what do you do? So, well, first of all, you need to adopt best practice when having labeling processes in your organization, okay? This is not some sort of casual afterthought, like, oh, I just hire a couple of people and label a bunch of stuff, no. You have to be very, very rigorous and careful. So, because labeling is actually can be very difficult. I mean, there's an example here where they're trying to find a detect on like an, I think it was like an iPad case or something, and you know, this seems like a defect, everybody would agree. This, there's no defect, everybody will agree. And then there are a whole bunch of things where like, uh, I don't know. Even expert labelers are going to disagree. So it's a hard problem, labeling. So uh, I won't go into all the details, but there's some great material out there uh, on the datacentricai.org website, which gives you best practices for how to do this. So please follow that, okay? Well, a couple of things I want to point out, oops, uh, is that, I guess the first thing is that whenever I work on a deep learning project, I have a situation, I manually label the first 100, 200, 500 examples on my own before I actually write up the code book to teach people how to label it. Because you might think, ah, it's pretty easy, cat, dog, yeah, no problem, right? Defect, improvement, no, 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 no. You work on it over a whole weekend, trust me, you'll get much wiser at the end of it. And your code book is gonna be much better. You will understand all the corner cases really, really well, okay? And then you start with small pilots. You know, label a bunch of stuff with your labelers, make sure you audit all the results, and then slowly scale it up, right? In short, best practice for doing any complicated project. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of other great uh, advice here uh, in these resources. Okay, so you did that, you have a good thing. Now the obvious thing you would do is, oh yeah, sure, if I, you know, I'll collect more labeled examples, right? Rather than worry about which labels are bad, which labels are correct, and so on, which by the way is actually a tricky problem to figure out. 
you can go in there and say, you know what, I'm just going to throw much more label data at it because if I throw a lot of label data, so what if just a few percent of it is bad as long as I can, basically you're making it up on volume. If you can make it up on volume, clearly it's going to average out all the bad stuff and I'm going to be okay at the end. Yeah, sure, that can work, but it's a lot of work because you have to collect label data, right? It is much better to fix the darn labels, okay? And here you have an example where, you know, they have a situation where you have 500 training examples painfully labeled, you know, by humans, and it turns out 12% of them were wrong, and the accuracy was below 50%. Fixing the labels increased the accuracy to 60%, which is not bad, but to get to the 60% accuracy level without fixing the bad labels, you would have needed another thousand labeled examples. Okay? Like the ROI is mind-bogglingly clear. Fix the labels. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing you want to do is when you go through this loop, you should not, when you find the model is making errors, it's not where it needs to be, you, you should not just go ahead and collect a bunch more labeled data to, make, to increase your data, right? What you want to do is you want to slice and dice the model's errors and try to get some insight into where exactly it's making mistakes. And then only in those areas where it's having difficulty, go and get unlabeled data from those regions and just label them, right? It's going, the ROA on that is much better than just going and grabbing. It's more work. That's why most people don't do it. Okay, I, mean, I guess you're hearing a gentle theme here. But, uh. So here's an example. This team is working on a speech recognition model, and they realized when they looked at the error rate that the, the model was screwing up essentially whenever there were car noises, traffic noises in the background. Right? That was a great insight. Because now, instead of just going and collecting a bunch more speech samples, they can go and collect speech samples where there is traffic noise in the background. And they do that, they enrich the data set with this, and it gets better. Another example. This team is working on a, uh, you know, a, uh, uses slides to help pathologists figure out, you know, whether a particular area, is, the lesion is, you know, benign or ma malignant, and they noticed that they were whole. They were, I mean, I, I won't get into the technical details here, except that they figured out that the errors are mostly coming from false positives, from uh, mimics of cancer, essentially things that look malignant but they're actually not malignant. Okay, and so they went and extracted additional training from those difficult regions, retrained the model only with those examples, and boom, it's get better. And by the way, right, these examples, you have a few hundred examples in the, in the beginning, then you go get 10 examples of this stuff, and it improves. 10 examples, okay? So, all right, and here's another fun one where you, know, you have this uh, uh, bicycle detector, uh, which you can use in an autonomous vehicle to figure out if in the camera image there's a bicycle or not. And they noticed it has a high error rate for these kinds of images. Any guesses what, what it's, what's going on here? And for those of you who have seen it in uh, my lecture or something, <laughs> stay quiet. Yeah, that is true. Like the contrast between the foreground and the background is pretty bad. That could be it. In this particular case, it was not. But in general, yeah, your point is valid. So it turns out it was primarily detecting two adjacent circles and labeling it as a bicycle. So whenever there was a saddlebag, it couldn't see the back wheel. So it thought, there was, it thought there was only one circle. So it's like, oh, two circles, bicycle, one circle, no bicycle. Right? So do not drive your bicycle anywhere close to a Tesla. <laughs> so so th what is the fix for this? Very simple. Get more pictures of bicycles with saddlebags. Then it'll know. All right, cool. So and how, how you can get additional targeted label data uh, you can do traditional data collection, but you know, data augmentation could be a great thing. Like if you have a whole bunch of saddlebag pictures already, just not enough of them, you can take them and augment them and create variations of it, and that'll be a great way to enrich the data set. There's a whole field called synthetic data generation where uh, you can do this in a much more sophisticated way, which unfortunately I won't get into in the interest of time, but those are all some things you can do. So what is the impact of doing this data-centric approach versus a model-centric approach? There are three examples here. Right here, model-centric approach doesn't b move the needle at all for this particular problem from the baseline, and then you get this dramatic jump when you go to a data-centric approach. And you can see similar uh, things on, you know, very sort of, uh, you know, non-consumer internet applications, right? These are hardcore manufacturing applications. Steel de defect detection, solar panel defect detection, and so on and so forth. So, uh, by the way, the data-centric AI thing is a great way to incorporate the d expertise of non-ML domain experts into your flow. And, and in many ways, I think this actually is one of the most beautiful things about using data-centric AI, right? They are, by definition, uh, the, you know, they are, by definition, by definition, <laughs> all right, 
Yeah, so they, they know the data much better than you ever will, right? So they can play actually a central role in figuring out what's going wrong and fixing these labels. They actually have an intuition for what regions of the input space may be causing the model problem. Uh, so for example, they could be like, oh yeah, I know what happened because we had an outage in the camera system around Thanksgiving time, and boy, we actually used a, a lower resolution camera as a stand-in, and this data is coming from there. They will have institution knowledge that can really save the day, so using them, incorporating them in your process is actually fantastic. Also, frankly, once a model is deployed, you don't want to be around when things go badly, right? The, you, know, you don't want to be getting calls on Christmas Eve uh, you know, on your cell phone. But if you empower them to actually solve these things by yourself just by adding more data, right, they become self-sustaining. Because adding more data doesn't require programming knowledge. right? doesn't require deep learning knowledge. It just requires smartness about the domain. And yeah, and this, I love this quote by Andrew Ng where he says, 50 thoughtfully engineered examples can be sufficient to explain to the network what you wanted to learn, right? Which I think is fantastic. It's a great thing. All right, final, so in conclusion, don't start from scratch. Use pre-trained models. Keep an eye out on foundation models. It's not ready for prime time yet, but maybe ready in three years. Uh, and you want to be dabbling in it now. Uh, and then finally, follow data-centric AI practices. So this covers the gamut of you know, start with better models and work with data in a better way. And together, I think it has a great promise to reduce the amount of labeled data you need for your important, you know, non-consumer internet applications. Thank you. Do we have any time for questions? Yeah, we have time for maybe two quick questions. Very good, very good speech, right? So, Thank you. Um, I kind of like your segue at the end, and it kind of dovetails into my question. How much do you think uh, things like knowledge graphs and domain expert knowledge, uh, particularly when you combine them with model agnostic meta learning, yeah. can help out? Because you, you see the general theme there is like, yeah, you can train the conventional ones with, a, with big data, but big data has big errors in it, right? And so the ones that, that learn sort of on the focused data sets, where you can think of them as an ultra dimensionally reduced be a network model. Yeah. Focused examples are way better, and then you can just build off of those. Can you use the humans to guide, go from supervised learning, catalyze it into self-supervised, and then meta-learning on into full, intelligent, unsupervised learning? Yeah. No, I think it's a great question, and it's a deep question, so I can't do justice to it very quickly. But let me just say that uh, domain knowledge and the knowledge mm -hmm. graphs and so on can be used in at least two places. One place, of course, is to make sure that the kind of model, pre-trained model that you use has the right priors in it right. so that it doesn't waste its parameters learning stuff you already know to be true about your world. Right. Right? So you can actually use that knowledge to construct the right prior uh, for your pre-trained model. The second thing, of course, is to guide uh, the targeted collection of incremental label data uh, for your particular use case, exactly. right? And so they are both incredibly valuable. And I would say that I'm seeing a lot of tools mm -hmm. uh, being created as we speak. Um, there is a tool called Snorkel, for example. Yeah. Uh, there are very interesting tools in which they basically say, look, there's going to be a very knowledgeable human in the loop. That human is not knowledgeable about ML or deep learning. They are knowledgeable about the domain. How can we best sort of you know, partner with them to get this job done. And so they have invented methods like the human will label a few examples, and then the model will label everything else, and then it'll randomly pick yeah. things where the model says, look, I'm really not sure about this particular thing because the probability of whatever is 51%, right? Barely more than 50%. And then the human can look at it and say, oh, you missed it. You got to fix this. And that iterative human and loop process, I think, can be super powerful. Right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I think there was a question here, Catherine. Yes, I, I, I was curious with, um, with prompting, with, with fine tuning your adjusting model parameters, yeah. with prompting, where is the knowledge stored in the model from prompt to prompt? Is, yeah. it, is it a fine tuning of the last layer, or you know, no, how does it remember what it learned in the two prompts? Great question. It remembers uh, in two ways. The first way it remembers is that when you, when you ask it a new question, every time you ask it a new question, you have to give it all the examples you used previously. So the very first time you use it, let's say you had three examples, and then you ask a fourth question, it gives you an answer. The next time you want to use the system, you give it again three examples. So each time, the question contains the prior knowledge it needs to answer the question. Uh, the other way is that there are now models in which you can, don't even have to give it an example. You can tell it things like, okay, translate this from English to French for me, and then just give it the English thing. It'll give you the French back. And that's because these models are trained on all of Wikipedia, a huge amount of text. Therefore, they sort of figured out what the word translate means. 
right? And they know what English means. They know what French means. So because of that, they can handle certain kinds of tasks without any examples whatsoever. Yeah, pretty cool, right? Yeah. All right, great. Thanks, everyone.